Hello, I'm Sally Wiener Grada, and this is What If? Why Not? How? Where I ask people who have interesting stories and ideas, questions that are on my mind. Today, my guest is Dr. Melissa R. Clapper. Melissa is a professor of history and director of women's and gender studies at Rowan University, and she's authored several books. Um, focused generally on two areas of history, both fascinating to me. Um, her books on American Jewish women's history paint vivid human profiles and perspectives of what it was like to be a Jewish woman in specific periods of American history. Um, and her, her ballots, uh, right, ballots, babies, and banners of peace, American Jewish women's activism from 1890 to 1940, won a National Jewish Book Award in Women's Studies. Congratulations on that. That's very exciting. Her newest book on the subject, which will be published in October, is The Civil War Diary of Emma Mordecai, which she did with the late Diane Ashton. Her other area of study is just as rich. It's the history of children and youth in the United States. Um, and that included the publication of Jewish Girls Coming of Age in America, 1860 to 1920, Small Strangers, which I'm in the middle of reading, love it. It's called Small Strangers, The Experiences of Immigrant Children in the United States, 1880 to 1925, and Ballet Class in American History, which is getting a lot of play because everybody in, in a certain group of people remember their childhood ballet classes. Her research has been awarded multiple grants and fellowships, and she lectures frequently in community and academic settings. Now, I met Melissa at a presentation in one of my favorite places in Philadelphia, the Rosenbach Library, and she gave a talk on Jewish women's activism. I was fascinated, and I simply knew that I needed to learn more. So, of course, I had to invite her on what if, why not, how? Thank you for joining me, Melissa. I'm delighted to be here. It's my pleasure to be here, Sally. Thanks for having me. Now, I asked you to prepare a short reading so our audience could get a sense of what you do. What are you reading from? So I'm going to read from the book you just mentioned, um, Ballads, Babies, and Banners of Peace, American Jewish Women's Activism, 1890 to 1940. This book is about American Jewish women in the suffrage, birth control, and peace movements before World War II. And I'm going to read um, basically from the opening, the very, very beginning of the book, the introduction. Great. Okay. The summer of her 17th birthday found Jenny Franklin enjoying a merry whirlwind of social activities with her circle of friends in Chicago. But on August 23rd, 1890, Jenny marked the day itself by solemnly writing in her diary, quote, it is high time for me to definitely shape my career and awaken to the duties of a woman. Some of the duties of a woman seemed obvious to a middle-class adolescent Jewish girl at the turn of the 20th century, and Jenny dutifully fulfilled them. She graduated from high school, helped out in the faltering family business, frequented public lectures, read a great deal to keep up her education, and in 1899, married the businessman Moses Purvin and subsequently had two daughters. Even as an adolescent, Jenny had been both a model young American woman and a model young Jewish woman, attending synagogue services, being confirmed, participating in Chicago's Hebrew Literary Society, socializing with other young Jews like her future husband, and consulting with her congregational rabbi for advice on starting out on, quote, the road I wish to travel. Neither Jenny nor anyone else in her milieu saw any contradiction between Jewish and female identity. Of all the Hebrew Literary Society events she wrote about in her diary, she relished most the debates on such subjects as racism and women's suffrage, secular topics given a serious attention in an explicitly Jewish setting. Once married, she not only focused on her private life at home with her husband and children, but over the decades also expanded her civic activities. Within the Jewish community, Jenny took on leadership roles in her synagogue sisterhood, the Chicago section of the National Council of Jewish Women, and the Chicago Women's Aid, the middle-class Jewish women's benevolent group. 
Participation in Jewish women's organizations neither confined Jenny to a strictly Jewish public life, nor precluded her steadily expanding commitment to the large American women's social movements of the day. Interested in suffrage from her adolescence, as an adult, she immersed herself in the cause still further, as she, like other American women during the Progressive Era, realized that disenfranchisement limited their power to achieve meaningful social reform. Members of a Jewish women's organization that she served as president wrote a poem in her honor that reflected her commitment to suffrage. Quote, this is not a good poem. Sidebar. <laughs> Jenny has the habit of being president. On the next election, her thoughts are now intent. Looking to the future, to 1916, what votes for women count for plainly can be seen. <laughs> the following decade, Jenny encouraged the Chicago Women's Aid to become involved with the burgeoning birth control movement by sponsoring the clinics that the Illinois Birth Control League set up during the 1920s. The League recognized the importance of local women's organizations in its work. Its 1926 annual report approvingly singled out Jew the Jewish women's group for regularly sending a delegate to its meetings and providing volunteer personnel to the clinics. Additionally, from the earliest years of the 1900s, Jenny devoted herself to a variety of women's peace organizations, especially the Chicago branch of the National Council of Jewish Women and the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom. She attended the 1923 National Council of Women biannual meeting as a National Council of Jewish Women delegate, with a special interest in the parts of the program devoted to peace activism. To each of these secular movements, she brought a Jewish sensibility, often carrying out her activism through Jewish women's organizations. The contemplative, aspiring Jewish girl she had been had now become a thoughtful, active Jewish woman who believed in her responsibility and power to make a difference not only to her own Jewish family and community, but also to the wider world. Jenny Franklin Purvin symbolizes Jewish women throughout the United States during the late 19th and early 20th centuries who developed a distinctive activist identity that drew on both their gender and their religious or ethnic identities. At various moments, they foregrounded each of these. American Jewish women who wanted to be both good Jews and good women found themselves negotiating, sometimes competing, sometimes complementary demands, and they daily made complex choices as their understanding of their American Jewish and female identities fluctuated. Participating in American women's social movements gave them the opportunity to make those choices. Significantly, white Jewish women who could at least theoretically hide their ethnic, religious, and cultural differences rarely chose to do so. They generally opted to sustain an open Jewish identity of some kind while participating in American women's movements, discovering convergences in values shaped by gender, class, national, and religious or ethnic identity. They drew on these common values when becoming involved with social movements, whether their paths to engagement led them to activism as individuals, as members of Jewish organizations, or as members of women's groups. The confluence of identity and activism was never static for these women. Changes in gender roles during the first half of the 20th century affected religious and ethnic women's, women and women's organizations, including Jewish women's groups. Class and religious differences shaped American Jewish women's social and political activism as well. So too did the exponential growth of American Jewry that resulted from mass migration at the turn of the century and the concomitant struggle to find a stance that balanced traditional culture with a rapidly modernizing American society. Various permutations of anti-Semitism also played a role in both limiting and directing Jewish women's social and political activism, and sometimes shaped their relationships with their non-Jewish activist counterparts. Jewishness mattered to them, especially a communal tradition of caring and support and a sense of social justice. All these factors promoted Jewish women's important involvement in early 20th century feminist movements, suffrage, birth control, and peace. Fascinating. Fascinating. I've read portions of this book already. I intend to be reading it intently. Uh, very. Um, in fact, I want to use it as a, a bit of research for a novel that I, uh, my next novel I'm going to be writing. Um, so it, I'm fascinated by all the work you do with this. Um, I'm curious, what was the impetus, the inspiration behind doing Ballots, Babies, and Banners of Peace? How did that begin? Uh 
Well, it began, it really goes back at least to when I was in graduate school getting my doctorate in American women's history. And it sort of ticked me off that there were basically no Jewish women showing up anywhere in the narratives, in the historiography, in the scholarship. It's It wasn't a total blackout. There is, um, you know, I'd say that work on American Jewish women in the labor movement sort of hit the uh, mainstream, you know, that that kind of work would show up, not least because one of the prominent historians, Alice Kessler Harris, who did that work um, was at Rutgers where I was, and I worked with her in getting my doctorate. So it wasn't surprising that that would be there. Um, she's not, she would not identify herself um, as someone who does American Jewish women's history, but you can't write about women in the labor movement in the United States without Jewish women. Um, but otherwise it just, it bothered me that you didn't see Jewish women showing up anywhere. And so one of my kind of prime motivating things for my entire scholarly career has been to look at the way that American Jewish women were part of those master narratives of American women's history, but also that there's a problem with the master narratives when they don't take American Jewish women, and I would say by extension, other more marginalized groups into account. That especially religion in some ways has been sort of written out of American women's history, particularly in the post-Civil War era. And again, this is not an across the board truth, but it's common, it's often the case. And I thought this is something that I really care about. And then particularly for ballots, babies and banners of peace, we, I knew that we had this research on American Jewish women in the labor movement, quite a lot of work on that. There's also a fair amount of work on American Jewish women in Zionism, particularly through the history of Hadassah. And so I really wanted to look at what American Jewish women were doing in larger women's social movements and non-sectarian social movements to see what role Jewish women played in the major women's movements of the early 20th century, which, of course, were suffrage, birth control and peace. And when you write about it, you have all this fabulous research that you do. But when you write about it, you're writing delightful stories about very flesh and blood, fallible, interesting women. I, yes. I, that is, that's the best part to me is that, um, you can just, it's what history is supposed to be. It's about people. And you've made, you, I, I bet your classes are like that too. It's it just, I, I know your lecture at the uh, Rosenbach Library was that way. But I'm, one of the things I'm curious about is when researching about American Jewish women history, history, women's history, what surprises and challenges did you encounter? I'm, I'm sure there were a lot, but if you can think of just a few of them. Okay, well, I think um, a word that you just used is a good word, the word fallible. Right. I'm not right. I'm writing about real people. Real people are not perfect. They're not what you want them to be. As sources, they're not what you would want them to be as a historian. I read a tremendous amount of diaries and personal letters and things like that for all the work that I do. And what you never, ever find is a diary in which somebody wrote, sat down in 1890 or whatever else and wrote, today I'm going to write about X because this is the way that I'm feeling about Y. That's just not what happens. <laughs> so you have to piece together narratives to make narrative sense of people's lives. Their lives made sense to them at the time, but they didn't write about it in that way. And mm -hmm. so one of the real challenges, but also something I absolutely love, is the challenge of doing deep dives into archival research to reading just huge amounts, I mean really huge for all my books, um, <laughs> of archival materials that no one has looked at since they were written and for the most part, you know, it's just serendipitous that they ended up in an archive someplace that somebody saved it somewhere along the way. And that's a way to recreate history from the bottom up, again, as you, as you already mentioned. I think of myself in both my work on American Jewish women and also the history of childhood as a social historian. I'm interested in history from the bottom up, not just the top down. Some of the people I write about are leaders, certainly in the community, but they don't. you don't have to be an international leader of anything for your life to have value. <laughs> and so I'm interested in restoring those voices, hearing what they said, getting better pictures of what individuals' lives were like, but also what the community was like in different times and places. And you do that by piecing together a fragmented historical record and doing the best that you can to analyze what you have within larger frameworks. But so, the, but the issue of fallibility is important because, um, particularly for my book that's coming out in October that you mentioned, this was not my project. I want to be very clear about this. Initially, this was the project of my late beloved um, colleague and mentor Diane Ashton, who was herself a pioneer in Jewish women's studies, a pioneer feminist religion scholar. And for about ten years, she worked on the Civil War diary of Emma Mordecai. It looks like it's spelled Mordecai, but it's actually pronounced Mordecai. Okay. 
which I didn't even know until I started to work on this project. And I, I spoke to Diane about it many times while she was working on it. It's because it's a Civil War diary. It's not in the same time period that I typically write about late 19th, early 20th century. It's earlier. And, um, and Emma was already a middle aged woman by the time the Civil War broke out. So it's really an antebellum story as well. And, you know, she's fascinating. But she was a racist slave owner. I mean, there's just no getting around it. That's who she was. And the diary, her Civil War diary, is a real testament to how there were American Jews who were rabid Confederate nationalists and who genuinely, sincerely believed in the racist system of slavery and who she saw herself as a very kind, benevolent owner of enslaved people, (laughs) Um, which she wasn't particularly. She wasn't physically violent, but she did constantly threaten to sell the enslaved people she owned, which is, you know, that's another kind of violence. Mm. And, um, you know, she she's a good example of somebody who is extremely flawed by today's standards, but even by the standards of the time. You don't historians don't typically apply standards of today to the past. That's not really the way mm-hmm. to do things. Um, so she's a good example of somebody fallible, but still invaluable. She's invaluable to the historical record. We have very few Civil War diaries from Jewish women, let alone from the South. And she's not the only one, but there aren't many others. And she is this very raw document. And so Diane's project was to really sort of look at Southern Jewish history through this lens and to think, think about the way that gender had an impact. And so when I picked up the project, I tried to honor those themes. Um, the, the manuscript was not finished. I needed to finish it and then revise it and see it through to publication. But I'm certainly, you know, my goal has been to try to honor Diane's interests. Um, and I learned a lot about the scholarship on the Civil War and slavery, which were, are not, again, my usual area of expertise. But Emma Mordecai is a good example of a fallible Jewish woman, but that doesn't make her life invaluable. Right? It still has value, yeah. but not yeah. as a role, not as a role model necessarily. But also the details of everyday life yes. that um, are often lost in history, except through diaries such as this. Um, I, I, in trying to research uh, periods for my writing, I'm I'm often filling in the holes of. What possibly what was it like to market for food? What possibly was it like to um, whatever the everyday involvement was? Um, and that's where you excel is giving us those kinds of palpable details. That's very exciting to me. I, I'm, I'm the kind of historian, there, there's lots of different ways to do history, both inside and outside the academy. You do not have to have a PhD to be a good historian, I'm not saying that. Um, but I'm very interested in story. I'm interested in people. Um, there is an important place in the academic study of history, at least for theory. You need to understand, I mean, everything happens within a context, both historical and when you're writing about it later from a, in a more theoretical framework. And I certainly pay attention to that. If you look at the bibliographies of any of my books, you'll see extensive reading. But I am most interested in people's lives and the way that those lives matter to them and what they have to tell us. Um, not that they have to be a lesson to us necessarily, but that a way for us to understand the past as as well as we can, right? Yes. You know, that's saying the past is a different country. They do things differently there. That is true. <laughs> um, but we can still, especially when we look through, one of the benefits of women's history and a social history approach overall is to get a sense of how regular people like us lived, right? Most people are not George Washington. They're yes. not even Martha Washington, right? Most people, that's not, that's not most people's experiences. And so, you know, to say that you don't matter unless you're someone like that, I find just too silly for words, really. And, and, and certainly in the academy, nobody thinks that anymore. Um, and so I'm very, I, I find that women's history and also the history of childhood, like these are both, you know, as, a, as genres, ways to get to people's real lived experiences and to try to get the detail and the flavor of that. And you do it so well. I'm curious, uh, what correlations did you find between social activism and the nature of being a Jewish woman? In other words, how did the fact that these women were um, Jewish influence their involvement in the social movements and vice versa? How did their Jewish sensibilities affect the path of these movements? Okay, so that's a great question, and there's multiple answers I'll try to be brief. <laughs> I mean, so the, the Jewish women that I write about it, it had different levels of attachment to, let's call it Jewishness, right? That mm-hmm. could be religious, it could be ethnic, it could be cultural, it could be heritage, or it could be just, oh, yes, I'm Jewish and I'm not going to deny it. But it could be anywhere along the, you know, 
it's a very, very wide spectrum of attachment. But the bottom line is that for most of them, Jewishness, whatever that meant to them, did have something to do with their activism. That they, most of these women, because they were Jewish explicitly, they write about it, they speak about it, they explain their activism through a lens of, because I am Jewish, I have an obligation to try to make the world a better place. Today, we would use the term tikkun olam, repairing the world for that. That's not a phrase that is in use at the time, the period that I write about, so you don't find it. But you do see references to tzedakah, translated, often translated as charity, but better it's better translated as a sense of righteous justice, I would say. Um, so you do, you do see explicit references to that. When Jewish women were addressing Jewish audiences, certainly they drew on biblical foremothers, so that um, some of the suffrage activists that I write about, for instance, would give speeches at, from the pulpit in synagogues, which was quite new in the early 20th century, and talk about, we should, you know, we today, Jewish women today, need to be more like the Deborahs, the Esthers of old. You know, we, they were judges, they were queens, they were public figures. We can be too, we should be too. And these were very effective arguments within the Jewish community, but they were also effective arguments outside the Jewish community for why Jewish women should be playing an important role. Look, we have this history and this set of ethics, let's call it, that we can bring to this movement that's really important. Um, I would say the movements that I write about, suffrage, birth control, and peace, are different from each other. Jewish women were very heavily involved in suffrage, but they very rarely rose to the highest levels of leadership. There weren't that many who did. There was quite a lot of anti-Semitism, along with racism and xenophobia of various kinds in the suffrage movement. And so uh, Jewish women were, uh, were not typically at the highest levels, but they were very involved on the, gr on the ground in lots of ways. So I think it would be hard to argue, and I don't try, I'm not pretending to make the argument in the book that... Judaism sort of affected the suffrage movement. I think that's too strong a statement. Um, but I do think that within birth control, and particularly within the peace movement, the very significant activism and leadership of American Jewish women, and actually Jewish women worldwide, not just in the U.S., did have an impact um, on, on those movements. They didn't make them Jewish movements, per se, but they did, the way that they brought their Jewishness to their activism had more of an impact, in part because they were more likely to achieve leadership positions in those two movements. But anti-Semitism was always a problem, and this is something else that's important, and actually I would say in some ways more important now than in 2013 when this book came out. The book talks quite a bit about anti-Semitism. That's something I always deal with in my work, um, including in the new book about Emma Mordecai or in my current book project, which we can talk more about. But the, you know, the uh, tensions around anti-Semitism and what we now would call progressive politics, not new. It's not new. And you see that in the early 20th century, or really the late 19th century as well. And it's actually distressing for me personally. It's a source of distress that it has this long history that pops up, but then just that, that never seems to totally go away. Um, and that's disturbing. I don't yes. want to get too political about it, but that's, you know, when I wrote, when the book came out in 2013, that I, I was writing about it at more of a remove in some ways than I might feel now. I, I very interesting and uh, a great overview. Thank you for that. I love your stories about the women. Do you have one or two women, not among the well-known uh, higher-ups, but who exemplify Jewish women's involvement in key social movements? Do you have one or two that you just love talking about? Okay, so two that I love talking about, that they're not very well-known, certainly not outside people who care about Jewish women's history, but there were two sisters named Maude Nathan and Annie Nathan Meyer, both born in the you know, right around Civil War era, and they were you know, active in all kinds of things. Annie Nathan Meyer was one of the founders of Barnard College, Okay, mm -hmm. somebody who believed deeply, and she was a playwright, she believed deeply in women's education, and Maude Nathan was involved in the National Consumers League, and then, um, so she advocated on behalf of working class women and you know, workers, she, the National Consumers League started a white label movement so that you would only buy something from stores and shops that treated their workers well, and then she became probably the most prominent American Jewish woman in the suffrage movement, both in the U.S. and abroad. So here you have these two sisters. They grew up in the same house, they had the same parents, they had similar educations, and yet Maude Nathan was a very fervent suffragist, and Annie Nathan Meyer was just as fervent an anti-suffragist, even though they were so similar to each other. And Annie Nathan Meyer was a founder of Barnard. She didn't think that women should be just doing whatever. And 
I just love talking about them because really, the really the answer to the the only real explanation possible for why Annie Nathan Meyer was anti-suffrage was that she and Maud could not stand each other, could not stand each other. Maud would say yay, and Annie would say nay. It didn't matter what it was about, and they made a spectacle of themselves. One would write a letter to the editor, and then the next week in the newspaper or the magazine, the other one would write an opposing letter. One would become an officer in the Equal Suffrage Association of New York, and the and then Annie would join the Anti-Suffrage Association of New York just because. Um, it's very, And they just, they, they debated each other um, in public venues. I, I, you know, I, I'd like to think they were enjoying themselves a little bit. I, I, it wasn't just animosity. That's a little hard to prove. <laughs> I, just, I sort of like to think so, but we have a lot of information about them. What I will say, my, my, my take, my interpretation is that Annie, that, that it was personal animosity that led Annie Nathan Meyer to post suffrage is because about two minutes after women finally got the right to vote, she joined the League of Women Voters. Oh. And so <laughs> I find that highly suspicious for somebody who had who kept up made a lot of noise. Um, <laughs> so they're, they're just two people who are fun to think about um, because they had this odd relationship with each other. Um, someone else that I actually really like to write about is the person that I started the reading with, Jenny Franklin Purvin. I have now written about her in multiple books. She is a star of my book on adolescent Jewish girls in the United States. Um, we know quite a bit about her as an adolescent um, and as a young adult. We have several of her diaries and a lot of her a lot of her papers. They're all in an archive uh, at the American Jewish Archives in Cincinnati, even though she was from Chicago. Um, and so I just we can trace her life over different stages. And so I've written about her girl and woman um, in my book about adolescent Jewish girls in the book about um, activists, as you just heard. And she is also making an appearance in my current project. <laughs> so I, I kind of enjoy getting to know the people that I'm afraid I sometimes refer to as my women, even though they're not <laughs> women. <laughs> but it's hard to not feel that way when I've been writing about them for a long time. And there are people that I have written about extensively in multiple settings. And so that's, that's been, that's been fun for me in terms of American Jewish women's history. Well, you mentioned the book that I wanted to touch on, uh, the uh, Jewish Girls Coming of Age in America, 1860 to 1920. Um, I'm fascinated by this book uh, because it, your research took you into the diaries of both well-known and un, um, unknown Jewish women, but their childhood diaries or, or their adolescent diaries. And it's also the timing. It's set in a time when immigrant adults were often dependent on their children to help them navigate this strange, confusing new world, as so many of our grandparents and great-grandparents did for their parents. Um, so it becomes very personal to me and to a lot of your readers. At the same time, they were growing up in a world where traditions were often subverted by the rush toward acculturation and the lure of mo the modern world. And I'm, I'm curious, you know, th this is very much the time period that a lot of our foremothers came to America or, or, were, or were born to their immigrant parents uh, in America. And I'm wondering about the shared family backgrounds that have shaped us today that comes from that era. And uh, what insights have you gathered about that kind of concept that this, what you were reading in these diaries were people who were going to shape how we feel and react to this world today? Well, a couple of things. So first of all, the time, this time period, which um, the late 1800s, uh, post-Civil War era really through, although in, this, in the book on Jewish girls, I do cover the Civil War period as well. Um, it's a moment of a lot of transformations. It's transformations in women's lives, all kinds of educational and employment opportunities, and certainly just status changes for women. So that, for instance, married women's property rights acts were passed and married, you know, things things improved. Now, clearly, look where we are today. We're still not, we're still not at total equality. So, but compared to what things were like in 1860, there's been improvement. Um, so it's a mo it, there's a lot of transformations in what's going on with American women in general, but also in the American Jewish community. In 1880, there were approximately, this is, you know, not a depth, no one knows the exact number. Let's, the approximate number, there were approximately 250,000 Jews in America in 1880. But two and a half million more came over the next um, four, four and a half decades. And so that is a radical transformation of the American Jewish community. 
But what I found, and this is the way that historians have been thinking about periods of Jewish migration in more recent years, is that what mattered most was not so much where somebody came from, whether they came from, you know, a, a, a town in Germany or whether they came from a shtetl in Poland or whatever, um, wherever they came from. What mattered most was how long they'd been in the United States so that you would structurally see, see real similarities between people who immigrated in, let's say, the 1870s and people who immigrated in the 1910s. They're just at different places along the same kind of ladder. There are changes. For instance, public education is much more accessible even at the high school level by the 1910s than it is in the 1870s. And that's even more true for higher education, um, which you know, some Jewish um, children, boys and girls, did have access to. So... I, I, structurally, though, there were a lot of similarities across those decades. So it's a, a period of great change, but there is also a kind of continuity. You know, children who the children or the children of immigrants in the 1870s also had to act as interpreters for their parents. But there was less bureaucracy and less of a presence of the state to interact with in the 1870s than there would be in the 1910s or the 1920s. But I did find that interesting, and it, it really... It, it supports the way that historians of American Jewry have been seeing the period between 1820 and 1920 as a century of Jewish migration. In the academy, for what this is worth, and again, I'm not suggesting that all truth comes from the ivory tower at all. In the academy, <laughs> we no longer talk about the German period, the Spartac period, or the German period, or the Russian period, because they're all completely wrong. Right. By 1700, there was already an Ashkenazic majority. So there, the Sephardic period, such as it was, was brief and it, it was influential culturally in some ways, but it doesn't last. To talk about the German period, when there is no country called Germany until 1871, is also a problem. Many of the Jews who came in the 1820s or 1830s came from Yiddish-speaking provinces of what would later become Germany, but they didn't even speak German. So there's problems with the traditional way that we thought about American Jewish history. And so I'm one of the people who's interested in looking at similarities across these time periods. And um, looking at Jewish girls' experiences does allow you to do that, while also, you have to note, being a girl in America in 1920 is radically different than in 1860. Yes, very <laughs> much so. Can you um, share with us one or two of the similarities that you found? Well, there's a similarity across the generations in Jewish interest in education. It's a stereotype and a generalization, but there there is quite a lot to that. There, we've had we have a lot of comparative studies, and of all the you know there were a lot of different ethnic and immigrant groups in the United States, and of those coming in that wave of immigration that starts in the 1880s, Jews really do, you know prioritize, let's say, education. That's not so much value it exactly as prioritize it. So for instance, Jews, and of course I'm speaking in gross generalizations here, mm -hmm. typically stayed in worse neighborhoods or in apartments for longer before they moved up to another neighborhood or they bought homes, if that meant that they could keep that way, use, they would use their resources to keep their children in school rather than buying property first. Whereas mm -hmm. other immigrant groups and the one that's often used as the counter example is um, Italians. And again, there was no such thing as Italians either until Italy unified as a country. There was no such thing as an Italian identity in Italy, only in the United States. So again, big sweeping statements here. But Italians typically prioritized um, property ownership. Before. Mm -hmm. So if that meant that everybody had to go to work when they were 12 in the family, so be it. What they share, though, is that what immigrant families in general shared, true across the decades, is a focus on the collective rather than the individual that the collective well-being of the family would matter more than any individual, which sounds sort of un-American, but was actually an American experience for many kinds of immigrant families. And another thing that you see is that your place in the family mattered. The best thing to be in a Jewish family was the youngest brother. The youngest brother would have the best access to education because he would have all these siblings working to keep him in school. Okay. You know, but, um, so it just so gender plays a role, class plays a role, place of origin plays a role, and there are these kind of cultural stereotypes. There were plenty of uneducated Jews. There were plenty of educated Italians. Like just to be clear, but there are patterns. Very, very interesting. Your stories are wonderful, um, and so of course, I'm very curious. You alluded to your current project. Could you tell us about that? So I noticed in writing uh, my books about. American Jewish adolescent girls and American Jewish women activists that they went abroad, like more than I might have thought. 
I mean, my first book about Jewish girls is started as my dissertation. This is something that I did research on starting in the mid nineties. I mean, so for a, lo a long time in the back of my head, I noticed that pe more people went abroad than I might've expected. And then when I was working on the activists too, I noticed really, you know, there's people going to conferences, going to international meetings, building relationships with activists um, overseas. I just, you know, and so in the back of my mind, I thought, you know, I think this is something worth looking into. I did not know if it could turn into a whole book. And so while I was working on my book about ballet class, the history of ballet class in America, which is not a Jewish studies book. I thought, you know, I, I, I'm aware of the correspondence of two women who took this amazing trip together in 1929. And I know from previous research that we have both sides of the correspondence and diaries that they both kept. They're not in the same archive, but we have both sides of the story, so to speak. Mm -hmm. I thought, all right, you know, I'm going to go reread all that stuff and write an article. And it'll help me decide if I think that there's something here. And it was immediately apparent to me that there's just a huge, huge, huge amount of archival material all over the United States about American Jewish women who went abroad for a variety of reasons during the, the decades between the late 18, uh, after the Civil War, before World War II. This is a period more generally that we call the democratization of travel, the development of mass tourism where tourism and travel abroad became accessible, not just to the elite, but also to regular folks. People who were still working as sweatshops probably still could not afford to go abroad. But anyone who was one step up the economic ladder, and most Jews were by the 1920s, not all, but most Jews were, could save up and go abroad at least once. Whether it was to visit the Alter Heim, to go back to the place of their families, they make hometown visits, or to, you know, go to Paris and see the Eiffel Tower. Um, and so uh, just a huge number, way more than anybody has ever realized, of American Jewish women and men went abroad. They studied abroad. They worked abroad. They were sightseers. They went all over the world. The majority to Europe, but I mean, a really significant number to Latin America, to uh, to Russia and then the USSR to Asia and then of course I'll have a whole chapter about this in this work in progress they went to Palestine um, and anyone who went there I mean Jews who went there were going because they were Jewish so it's a, it's a different it, it, the whole it's a different kind of travel but over the period of the, covered by these decades you know it was it became quite a fairly common experience for American Jews to go abroad and I'm this book which is currently called At Home in the World. American Jewish women abroad, 1865 to 1940, um, covers you know several generations of American Jewish women, but looks at um, looks at their travel thematically, their sightseeing, their education, their activism, um, the Jewish journeys that they took, the way that they did Jewish things abroad, even when they did not do them at home, which was quite a common experience, and also going to Palestine and. Some of my old favorite people are showing up again, <laughs> but I've also got new fa new favorite people, and um, it's just been it, it's been a really fun project. And I've done research in more than eighteen archives across the United States, so I can wow. tell a national story. And it's not only about wealthy people; there are wealthy people in the book, but <laughs> it's about you know, regular folks, especially after World War One, could and did travel abroad. And gender identity and Jewishness um, really had an impact, and American identity too, had a real impact on what that travel was like. And that's what I'm looking at. That sounds so cool. I have to know, where are you in the process? How soon are we going to get the book? Well, it'll be a little while. The, uh, the, the Civil War Diary of Emma Mordecai is coming out in October. So, you know, I was sort of working on two books at the same time, which I do not recommend. Kids, don't try this at home. <laughs> um, <laughs> So I have, I have basically, I've been on sabbatical this past year, including a fall semester as a scholar in residence at Hadassah Brandeis Institute at Brandeis, Ooh. which is a wonderful Jewish women's study center. Everyone go check it out, um, along with the Jewish Women's Archive. Check these out. These are amazing resources. And I'm on the academic advisory boards for both. So there's my plug. <laughs> And I, I, I have a draft of the book, basically. I have, I have a, my, that was my goal during my sabbatical year. I have a draft of every chapter and most of the other materials. Um, I am getting ready to submit a book proposal, and hopefully we'll have a contract relatively soon. And, I, you know, I can't tell you when that book's going to come out. It doesn't work like that. And in this kind of publishing, it can be a year from the time you submit a completed manuscript to its publication anyway. <laughs> so you'll have to watch this space a little bit, but it shouldn't be too much longer. And I, I have been working on this project quite a long time, but like many historians, I lost two years to COVID when all the archives were closed. Mm -hmm. I couldn't do any work. The kind of material I look at is typically not digitized. 
You know, yes. a lot of people think everything's online. It's not, as <laughs> particularly when you're reading women's history, history of childhood, nobody's digitizing this. No one can afford to put everything online. And so for almost two years, I was stymied and frustrated. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I couldn't, I couldn't work. So this book is taking me a little longer than it might otherwise have taken. But um, it, it is full of great stories. And also, I would like to thank Sharp Analysis of the way that um, Jewish and gender and American identity intersected for women as they traveled abroad. Well, from what I've read of your work, Sharp Analysis is a very definite aspect of it. But the storytelling is so engaging. Um, I highly recommend any of Melissa's books. In fact, I intend to probably buy every single one of them. <laughs> because I, it's just... They're, they're just something I need to have in my library for my own research, but also for my entertainment and my edification about my own heritage and uh, our country. I, I just find them fascinating. Thank you. Um, my guest today was Melissa Clapper. Melissa is the author of solidly researched books that tell compelling stories about American Jewish women's history and childhood in the United States. That includes Ballots, Babies, and Banners of Peace, American Jewish Activism, um, 1890 to 1940, which, as I mentioned, won the very prestigious National Jewish Book Award in Women's Studies. Uh, plus, we have the uh, book Jewish Girls Coming of Age in America, 1860 to 1920, and, and several others. And her newest book, The Civil War Diary of Emma Mordecai. Yes. <laughs> it doesn't spell that way. And that'll be published by NYU Press this October. And that's definitely on my shopping list. What's rather wonderful is because I'm really recommending these books. And I don't think you've heard me really, really firmly recommend this strongly across the board, a person, an author's books, whatever Melissa writes, read. Um, I'm rather thrilled the publishers of Ballots, Babies and Banners of Peace of Civil War Diary of Emma Mordecai and Ballet Class and American History have provided discount codes for us. So you're going to get a significant um, discount if you order them. Um, and I, on the end slide of this web, of this uh, video, I will be providing those. As for me, my two newest books are Of Being Woman, uh, which is a collection of feminist science fiction tales from Noble Fusion Press. And Daughters of Eve from Byte Publishing, which is an essay-based discussion workbook and journaling guide for exploring the nature of our lives today through the lens of the stories of women of the Hebrew Bible. My website and blog are at saudiwinagrada.com. You can also connect with me on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube. Sometimes I'm blue sky and I'm trying to get up the, find the time to figure out a uh, substack. I don't know when that'll happen. If you want to be among the first to read about some of my new adventures, appearances, essays, and books, and learn about other fascinating folks that I'm interviewing, please sign up for my very occasional newsletter on my website. Thank you for joining us. And Melissa, thank you so much. This was delightful and just as fascinating as I expected it to be. Thank you. <laughs>